Hey everybody, it's Lon Seiben and it's time for your weekly wrap up. It's another Monday and we've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to be looking at your voluntary dystopian future, FPGA based computers and whether or not this is going to become more of a thing. And we're going to look at VR's progression and seeing if maybe we're getting closer to some kind of consumer adoption. So lots to talk about, let's get into it. Now before we begin, I want to thank our newest members here on the channel, and we picked up a lot both on my donor box page and on Patreon. So we have Patrick Ingerson, Johannes Reb, Ether Seed, Javid, Javid Gazaluf, Jan Wilhelm Van Barneveld, and Victor Martinez. I think some of these folks might be returning contributors. So I want to thank everyone who's been contributing to the channel on an ongoing basis, along with these new folks, and everyone who watches on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now our ad today comes from Plex, as it does every month, and I want to talk briefly about Plex Pass on their behalf, because they are sponsoring the wrap-up this week. So we have covered a lot about Plex, which is my favorite media serving software here on the channel. It's basically a way to kind of roll your own Netflix, if you will. You can take all the media that you own and control, uh, put it on a server. It can run on a network attached storage device, as I do, uh, or you can have a little mini PC run it, for example, and then you can have that media made available to you on all of your devices. And what's nice about it is that if you leave the house, you can also watch your stuff when you're not at home. It's pretty cool. It compresses things on the fly. And when you go to the Plex Pass version of Plex, which gives you more features, uh, you get a lot of cool things like a DVR to record live TV off the air uh, or through your cable system. You can check out some of the videos. I'll link down below so you can find out more about it. They have a cloud server software, so you can actually use your Plex server in the cloud versus at your home. There's mobile syncing on Plex Pass for offline viewing. All of the Plex apps on all platforms become free. You get early access to new features, and you can also do what's called hardware transcoding, so you can take uh, something even as small and inexpensive as an Intel NUC and have it be able to, in real time, make your video smaller for uh, watching when you're not at home and have a bunch of people accessing it at the same time. Uh, that hardware transcoding really speeds up the processing of that video. And again, we've covered all of this in the playlist, which you can find down below. But uh, you can try Plex for free. And then if you want to, go up to the Plex Pass. And if you use our Plex Pass link there, uh, we'll get a small commission for it. I want to thank Plex for their ongoing support of the channel. So let's take a look at the week in review. On the Extras channel, I had a lot more up this week versus last week. So we have a bunch of unboxings, including the uh, new Lenovo Mirage products, which are part of Google's Daydream system. So we reviewed the headset on the main channel last week, and, and the camera that I unboxed is coming up uh, probably tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, so you can see those unboxings. I have some sample VR 180 footage from the Mirage camera. Uh, Corey is out actually shooting more of it right now. So if you've got Google Cardboard or a VR headset, you can experience some 3D 180 video that will be uh, provided to you. But you can initially get a sneak peek at my home studio here if you want to check that out. And we also unboxed that LG monitor that we reviewed last week along with that Netgear router. So lots to check out on the Extras channel. And on the main channel, we of course have that review of the Mirage Solo headset, uh, which is a VR headset that is self-contained. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. We also have that monitor review I just referred to and the router review that I just referred to as well. So a good amount of content with some in-depth look at some cool stuff. So be sure to check it out. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 61 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And uh, last week I went to my old high school to talk to some students there, which was kind of fun. It was always fun to go back there and see what's going on. Now I've been out uh, probably for about 24 years now, and it really is pretty much the same as I remembered it, and some of the teachers are still there as well. It's great to see uh, some dedicated teachers sticking it out for all that length of time, and it was fun talking to the students who are in a very different world than I was when I was in high school. And also this week, I think we've got the Prime Video thing working, and I'll know for sure in a day or two 
Uh, so our first uh, episodic thing on Prime is going up on Amazon. It's going to be available in the UK and the US. If somebody wants to come in and help with uh, German and Japanese subtitles, we'll try to get it up in other parts of the world. Uh, what we're going to experiment first on Amazon Prime is taking some of my dispatches where I go out to those shows and do the uh, almost the, the kind of a live look at what I'm finding as I'm walking around. Uh, we're going to start with those and see how it does on the Prime platform, and then I'll start taking some other content that uh, falls into buckets and uh, put that up as well. Basically, what I want to do is build kind of a, a, a series of episodes around specific topics on there. Again, the same content that I do here, just putting it up on Amazon just so that I can uh, explore being on other platforms. I might do something with the weekly wrap-up up there also once we figure out how this Prime Video thing works. The tricky part with Prime Video is that uh, they do monitor and approve every single piece of content that goes up. You need captioning, your thumbnails need to be in a certain format. So I've, I've had some issues with it over the years getting everything in compliance, but I think I finally got it figured out. So stay tuned, we'll be uh, doing some more on Amazon Prime very shortly, but nothing that I'm not already doing here. And now it is time for some things in the news that caught my eye. And uh, we're gonna label this segment your voluntary dystopian future because uh, what we have been doing over the last decade or so is turning over volumes of our personal information to companies like Facebook and Google and others. And I don't think when we started doing this back in the early 2000s, we really thought about the consequences of having decades of our personal data stored permanently somewhere that is in reach of hackers who might get our passwords, but also in reach of governments throughout the world. And there's no better case to kind of talk about related to this uh, than this one, which involves the Golden State Killer. Uh, this was a guy, a serial killer, who uh, for many years was terrorizing portions of California. He murdered a number of people, assaulted many others, and then he just stopped doing his crimes and kind of melted back into society. He had no arrest records, so all the DNA they had, they couldn't match up with anybody. But uh, over the last couple of years, a lot of people have been taking those DNA tests like 23andMe and Ancestry.com and uh, now our DNA information is being stored with these companies that is in within, that's within reach of uh, the government here in the U.S. and I would imagine other governments around the world. And police researching this case and trying to finally solve it had an idea. Why don't we take this guy's DNA and upload it somewhere where we can try to figure out who he's related to? And you can't just go to 23andMe, at the moment at least, with uh, some DNA from a crime lab and get it uh, sequenced there. I'm sure maybe they could if they were compelled to do so. But instead what they did was they sequenced the DNA, uh, generated a raw file, and uploaded it to a website called GED Match. And this site is a free and open source kind of effort that allows people to upload their DNA tests from different services and match them up through GED Match. And the reason why this is interesting and valuable to people is that uh, if I have family members somewhere who I don't know, uh, who maybe used Ancestry.com for their DNA test and I use 23andMe, I'm not going to find them on 23andMe, so you can go to uh, GED Match here and get your data uploaded. And if somebody else related to you did the same thing, uh, you can match up even if you use different DNA services. But the problem here is that this is open source information. So what you are doing when you are sharing your data with GED Match is essentially sharing your DNA profile uh, with the world so that they can make these matches for you. And the police figured, hey, let's take a shot here and see if we can figure out who this guy is related to. And what do you know? When they uploaded his DNA, uh, they got a match and they were able to very quickly narrow down a list of potential suspects given what they already knew about this guy. And of course, this generated a lot of controversy and GED Match put up a notification on their website here on April 27th to uh, just let people know if you don't like the fact that somebody might be able to find your DNA after you willingly uploaded it to their site, you can delete your profile. Uh, in this case, the police just used this site like any other user would. They uploaded a DNA profile and it matched it up. There wasn't a subpoena or a warrant or anything else like that, but there is now a lot of genealogical data stored on sites like this one, like Ancestry.com, like 23andMe, and there is no reason why the government can't access that information just like they could anything else stored on a server somewhere if they have a warrant or a subpoena or whatever to compel those companies to do it. And this is the era that we're in. We are somehow just okay with willingly turning over all this information to private companies where uh, if the government had asked for the same thing, there'd be outrage 
outrage over it. And the best part is, at least in the case of 23andMe and Ancestry.com, we're paying them for the privilege. Here's a hundred bucks, take my DNA, store it in perpetuity, and uh, who knows what'll happen to it after that. And this is ex an example of kind of the world we're living in these days. And now with the success of this case, they're going to be going after other cold cases. And I have no doubt that at some point, and it may already be happening, uh, we'll see some of this information provided after the government compels these DNA uh, companies to turn it over. Uh, they got lucky with uh, GED Match because there's not a lot of people that use that site, but some of the really hardcore genealogical researchers, you know, the casual ones like uh, me soon, uh, are putting their information there, hoping to kind of find uh, the lost portions of their ancestry. And uh, somehow they just managed to get a good result here. But if they're not on there, I would be very surprised if law enforcement did not do something with 23andMe, Ancestry, and others to compel them to turn over information. But it's not just your DNA that's stored everywhere. I was thinking about uh, when Gmail first launched in 2004. And before the launch of Gmail, uh, the most you would get sometimes on a free email account on the web was maybe five megabytes of storage. Before that, uh, your email downloaded to your computer and then it was deleted from the server. But uh, Google really wanted people to retain their email and offered a gigabyte of storage for anyone who got their free account. It was hard to get one initially, but uh, they had put this thing up on their uh, news release about it. Uh, Google believes that people should be able to hold on to their mail forever, and that's why it comes with a thousand gigabytes. And at the time, that sounded like a great idea. Of course, now you get even more storage for free on Gmail. But remember, every email that's stored on the Gmail server is accessible to you with your password, but it might also be accessible to governments throughout the world who can compel Google uh, to turn over that information or you could get hacked like many people in the news have been over the last uh, year or so, especially during the 2016 election. And a whole bunch of people you don't want getting access to your email can get it as well. So we have to start thinking about what are we putting out there? What are we publicly uh, making accessible even if uh, we think it's private? The reality is there's a company there that cares about its shareholders as they're legally required to do. And oftentimes people who are getting a free service from that company are not going to be ranked in the order of their shareholders. And if the government says turn over that data or else, they're going to think about their shareholders because they don't want the or else happening to them. And that's something we all need to keep in mind. The other thing I was thinking about were some of these voice assistants like Google Home and, and Amazon Alexa. So I just went through my activity here on my Google Home and you can see that uh, it records everything that happens after I trigger it. And there was a couple of instances here where uh, it was accidentally triggered and recorded what was going on in the room at the time. Uh, that's now sitting in a Google server. And if the government ever wanted to, they could go and issue a subpoena or a warrant to Google and they would have to turn over those recordings. And I can delete them, but as you know, nothing's really ever deleted, especially if Google knows they have to retain this information if there is something in the future that requires or compels them to turn it over. And this thing records everything I've ever asked that device or anything that it thought I asked uh, over the course of my ownership of it. And it's all sitting up there in the cloud for people to be uh, able to rummage through. Uh, the same goes for Alexa here. Here's a bunch of examples where uh, Alexa was accidentally triggered and it recorded what was going on in the room at the time. And here's another thing that I have on my phone right now that I forgot about. Uh, this is the Google Maps timeline. And what this does, if you enable it, is it records your position wherever you go with your phone and keeps a diary essentially of where you've been on every single day. And this is an example of where I was on January 8th, 2018 when I was at CES. It uh, mapped my entire progress throughout Las Vegas that day. And uh, every, every day before and after it's kept a log of as well. I think there's probably several years worth of information uh, stored up here. Thankfully, this is an opt-in at the moment, but I think there was a time when this wasn't. Uh, so if you do have Google Maps on your device, maybe check the timeline feature and see if it's enabled or not. Because once that information gets up there, it's there permanently, even if you think you deleted it. I'm sure there are ways that they can get that information out if they are compelled to do so. And there was another case that happened here in my home state of Connecticut. And this is a murder case where uh, this guy here in the photo allegedly killed his wife. And initially he claimed that uh, somebody had broken into the house and tied them up and that unknown perpetrator had committed the crime. But police have a different idea. They're charging the husband in this case. And uh, what they found, first of all, was that uh, he had conversations with 
uh, a woman that he was having an affair with who became pregnant. They had all the text messages going back and forth between uh, the husband and the woman he was allegedly having the affair with. And then they went further because they were able to get uh, the Fitbit data from his wife's Fitbit that she had on her wrist. They were able to use that to determine the approximate time of death. They were able to see how many steps she took in the house and saw that it didn't line up with the husband's story about uh, what went on in the home before the murder took place. Uh, they also were able to get information from Verizon on uh, the data connections that the Fitbit was making through its app to synchronize up with their servers. And they were able to piece together a timeline, again, based on all this information that's being stored up in the cloud, uh, including things from an internet service provider. And that's often the, uh, the biggest link in this chain is that anything you do on the internet is usually logged by your ISP. So even if you're trying to be private about something and doing an incognito window or whatever, uh, the IP address is the IP address and that ISP will likely have a log of where you went. And they used all of this information and pieced together a timeline. And uh, I would suggest if you're interested in how the police are using all these cloud services now, uh, take a look at the arrest warrant in this case. It is highly detailed about uh, the methodology that they used, the information that they got, where they got it from, how they used the Fitbit. And it was kind of a fascinating read because it does give you an idea as to uh, really just how much information is being stored and there and accessible uh, should the government ever want to access it. And I think we have, again, so much information about us that's now being uh, stored as a permanent record out there that I think we're going to be seeing uh, more and more of these cases get uh, essentially solved in ways they couldn't be solved before because so much of our lives now depends on our whereabouts and all of the things that we do uh, being logged and stored somewhere, which was not the case uh, 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, that's just what really has me thinking these days is that I think if you were to go back in time and describe the world we're in right now to somebody, they would think you were nuts because why would you ever store all that personal information up on that server? Uh, you know, a decade's worth of personal correspondence in the case of Gmail, for example, or uh, the fitness device that tracks all of your heart rate and movement and stores that somewhere, or the phone that logs your location everywhere you go. And all this stuff, which again, would be scary if a government was collecting it, but somehow we're just okay with these private companies grabbing all that data from us because we trust them. But I think there is uh, probably a good case to be made about why we should take that trust lightly uh, and the fact that the government doesn't need to collect this information because these companies are storing it for them voluntarily. And in many cases, like big telecoms and big ISPs, they actually make money uh, cooperating with law enforcement by providing means for the, uh, the government to get data from them quickly and efficiently, like the NSA has been doing with cell phone metadata here in the country. So just some food for thought. We are living in a dystopian future, and it was uh, voluntarily created by all of us consumers who like all these cool free services that we use all the time, and we like our smartphones and uh, all the conveniences that they provide us in the modern world here. And in many ways, it's impossible not to be sharing this information because we all need it in this global society that has the internet kind of as the connective tissue of the modern economy. And uh, again, it's just going to be impossible to shield yourself from everything. But you do have some control. Uh, you can decide what goes out on the internet. That includes things you might email privately to somebody. That includes the things that you put up on Facebook. I have long thought about the pages that I like on Facebook knowing that that is a very public act. Clicking even the like button is letting the world know that you have a preference to, towards something or some brand. And if you're not comfortable with the entire world knowing it, even though Facebook might say it's private, nothing is ever really private on the internet like I like to tell my, my kids and will continue to remind them about. There are some benefits perhaps to all of this information being out there. We might be able to solve crimes more efficiently. We might be able to prevent people from getting hurt or injured by other dangerous people out there. But uh, all of this comes at a cost of privacy, which is where we are at. And again, I don't think there's any way we're going to roll the clock back on this. But you can think before you click. And that is the best advice I can give you at this point. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And we're going to be going back to a time before our computers were selling out our personal information to corporations and to the government. And we're going to get this question in from the penciler who had a question about FPGA devices. And when you hear FPGA and you've been following what these devices can do, you probably think about the analog devices like the NT Mini here that we reviewed recently. 
Uh, this is a Super Nintendo clone console that connects up to HD televisions. And rather than emulate those devices, it simulates it uh, with an FPGA processor. And there's some semantic argument as to whether or not this is in fact emulation because it has to be programmed. But generally the way these chips work is that the FPGA uh, is essentially a blank slate that gets programmed every time the device boots up and it replicates the behavior of different types of chips. And you can uh, essentially rebuild a game console inside one of these chips and have all the timings work the same. And the code that runs those games is actually executing against these replicated chips. So there's nothing to connect in software like you would with an emulator uh, to make it work with new hardware. It is, in fact, from the software standpoint, running on the original hardware because the chip is programmed to behave exactly like, uh, in the case of the Super Nintendo, the 65C816 processor. Uh, but these things from analog are not the first ones to be using this technology. FPGAs have been around for quite a while. They have a lot of uses in industrial environments. It's kind of nice to have a, a piece of silicon, essentially, that can be reprogrammed if you have a bug or something that uh, happens after the product ships. And uh, there are some ways to run old computers on these things in addition to old game consoles. Uh, the NT Mini, which was the prior version of the analog console that ran Nintendo games, had a bunch of other cores you could load onto it to have it be other consoles like the Atari 2600 and the NES and uh, the Master System, the ColecoVision, a whole bunch of stuff which I've covered before. Uh, but it doesn't do computers. But one box that does is something that uh, the penciler here is referring to in his tweet. Uh, which is the Mist FPGA computer. And I happen to have one. I got it a while ago and I was meaning to do a video on it, but I felt like it wasn't quite there from a consumer standpoint. It actually does the computer simulation quite well, but I just never got around to doing the video on it. And I might do one in the future if enough of you are interested in what you're about to see to warrant a longer video. So we're gonna kind of just do a brief overview of this real quick here on the wrap up. So. This is the uh, Mist PC. Inside is an FPGA. It can do 8 and 16-bit computers, some better than others. On the side here, it has analog joystick inputs, so you can plug in an old Atari controller and some old Amiga and Commodore controllers into it. Some of the cores support these, some don't. It depends on which core or computer you're trying to simulate with it and how far those authors came along in developing that. Uh, all of this stuff is open source, so there's a lot of code that you can learn if you want to try to make these cores better. You can do that, and it might be fun if you're interested in FPGAs to pick one of these things up, grab some of those cores off of GitHub, and start playing with the technology. Uh, the biggest issue I have with it though is that it only outputs VGA, uh, which be, creates an issue because it does simulate the original hardware and in many cases it's hard to get our modern displays, first of all to take VGA in some instances, but in other instances to properly replicate the resolution and uh, refresh rate that these old computers and consoles did. So I'll show, you, I'll show you a few that work better than some of the other ones, but you'll run into some trouble, especially if you don't have a VGA display. You could get a scaler or something to make it better, but that might introduce some input lag and that kind of thing. I'd love to see a new version that has a built-in uh, scaler to adapt it to HD better, but this one doesn't have that. Audio out here, you've got four USB ports and I've plugged in my little Logitech wireless dongle for my keyboard trackpad combo here. Power is USB and you got a power switch here. So let's boot it up and show you what this is all about. You're going to hear a beep, which is the old Apple II beep. And what I have it configured to do is to boot up to the Apple II Plus by default. It'll take my monitor here a second to come back on because I apparently turned it off. So let's get that booted up. Uh, so you can see here we've got the Apple II up on the screen. I can hit F12 here on my keyboard and select a disk image. So I'll boot up Spy Hunter, a fun game I used to play on my Apple II back in the day. Now the, the best Apple core they have is Apple II Plus, which is what this is. And unfortunately will not do the Apple IIe or the 2GS. I think it would be capable of that, but nobody's written a core to do that. But you can hear the sound here. It sound is actually pretty close to what I remember the Apple sounding like. And uh, here we've got Spy Hunter running here and it seems to uh, run a lot of the Apple II software just fine. Just note that the Apple II is a little different than the 2E and the GS and that it had less RAM and not everything on the uh, Apple II, uh, 2E will run on the Apple II, for example. So some software might be limited there, but uh, it's got some controls on the front here so I can hit the reset button with that button there. And then I think I can go into um, 
the uh, basic here if I hit that reset button quick enough there on that. So uh, you can do a lot of the original uh, things you can do. AppleSoft Basic, of course, is built into it so you can program basics. So I could say, uh, you know, 10, uh, oops, print, what is, oops, forgot my quotation marks here. Uh, what is your name? Um, and I can just hit run and there you go. So you can do some basic uh, coding on there if you want. Now, if I want to make it a different computer, I can go over to the firmware and core. I can change the FPGA core and go over to the Commodore 64 if I wanted to. So another 8-bit computer, and I can just hit enter here, and that will boot up a Commodore 64. Uh, this is really well executed in here. You can get floppy images and run a bunch of games on it. I think the uh, joystick ports here are compatible with the Commodore 64 core. Uh, so you can just do that very easily. And it's kind of cool to have a computer that is just a, you know, a, a blank slate and it works with a keyboard and mouse and everything. It really feels like a computer, which is kind of cool. And when I'm done with that, we can go into the more modern computers, if you will. The uh, Mac is uh, represented here, the Mac Plus only. Uh, so it doesn't do the color Macs or anything. Uh, the penciler was saying that there might be a Mac 2 uh, core, but actually they called the Mac core Mac Plus 2 or something, and it's T-O-O -O and not T-W-O. So uh, they must have um, just come up with a cute name for it, but it really is just a black and white Mac Plus. So let that boot up here, and you just have to point a disk image at it. So you heard the beep when it came up, and we're going to get the uh, floppy thing here like it needs to find something. So I can just load up Mac Draw real quick and get that going. And what's nice is that uh, most of the cores for computers that have mouse support uh, work with a USB mouse, as this one does. So when our uh, little fake Macintosh here boots up, we should be able to see that. Uh, this image is one where, or this core is one where you'll see there are some uh, aspect ratio and refresh ratio issues with it. So uh, as it comes up here, it might be hard to see on camera, but um, this uh, background isn't looking solid. There's little checkerboards on there because the screen is not uh, scaling properly here. Um, the text looks nice and sharp on it though, so maybe I could change the background if I wanted to, but you can see that in the corner there, things are a little cut off on that, so uh, not perfect from a display perspective. And that's one of the issues you run into when you've got you know, these modern LED displays, uh, even with VGA connected, just can't get the right uh, aspect ratios and resolutions that the original hardware did. So you might do better with an old CRT uh, monitor or perhaps a uh, you know, LED display that has a built-in scaler for better effects. So we'll load up uh, Mac, uh, Mac Draw here. And you can see it takes a while for this stuff to load because this is really about the speed that these things loaded up with back in the day. This is running at exactly the same uh, clock speed essentially and all the I.O. is running at the same speed. So even though we have an SD card here driving everything, uh, it's running at the original hardware speed, so you get kind of a real, you know, real genuine feel to this. Now, when you're done with the Mac, you can hit F12 again, and we'll just go over to another core here. So we'll pop open the Amiga core for our last computer of our little test here. And I think the Amiga is probably the most well-supported platform on the MIST. I think the Atari ST is a close second uh, in that. The 8-bit computers, of course, do fine, uh, but they've done a really nice job with this Amiga core. It really feels... Uh, like an original Amiga. Now, I did not own an Amiga uh, back in the old days. I had played with them, you know, here and there, but uh, it felt pretty good to me here. We're going to load up It Came From the Desert, uh, which was a really cool game that kind of showed off what the Amiga was capable of back in the late 80s here. So we'll let Amiga DOS load up. And again, the mouse, as you can see here, is working fine. And of course, you can load up the Amiga's operating system. I think it has some uh, hard drive image support, so you can really build yourself a nice little Amiga uh, with this thing, kind of a mid-range to low-end one. I don't think it can do what the higher-end Amigas did, but uh, for games and that kind of stuff, it should be fine here. We'll just let this boot up for a second. Uh, this game was from a company called Cinemaware, which made some really awesome stuff uh, back in, the, again, the late 80s, and the Amiga was kind of the platform where their uh, software did had the, the most uh, p uh, pizzazz to it, I guess you could say. I used to run these on my 2GS, the Apple 2GS, but the Amiga had something a little special to it in the graphics and sound department there. So. Uh, there you go, you can get a feel for uh, what that looks like. And it also does game consoles, but it's not as strong with those. What I'm going to do here is just switch it off because I found there was an issue when I switched from the Amiga to this other game console. So we're going to switch it off and switch it back on again. And one of the cores I found on there was a TurboGrafx-16 core. Uh, so let's go over to that. It's also known as the PC Engine in other parts of the world. And we can load that one up. And this is one that really looks a little flaky on here. You can't see this on camera, but this is kind of... Um, uh, flickering right now as I'm jumping through the menu here. And when I load the game up, it does a little bit better uh, most of the time here. I think it just froze up on me. Let's see. 
Uh, it looks like it froze up on me. So let me, <laughs> let me take a quick jump cut here and uh, reboot it once again. Uh, and again, this is all open source stuff, so you'll get these kind of lockups here every once in a while. So let me get that game loaded up for you so you can see what it looks like. All right, so we got it booted up now. This is the uh, PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 core, and it's locking up on me quite a bit here. It wasn't doing it before, but now it seems to be doing it a little bit more than it was before. Uh, but again, I don't think the game consoles are as mature on here as you might find on the analog uh, NT Mini, for example. So that one might be the one to pick if you want to do uh, some accurate simulation of 8-bit games. But uh, this does show you that it's possible to do more complex systems like the TurboGrafx-16 on an FPGA, and hopefully we'll see uh, more of that from analog and others. But I think where this thing really shines is as a computer simulator. And if you have an interest in those 8 and 16-bit computers, it might be worth checking out. I'll put a link down below in the video description for where you can find more information on this on its GitHub page so you can see what cores it supports. And uh, you can try to find one for yourself through there. I had to buy mine through uh, Europe, actually, so it took a while to get it. But it's been kind of fun to play with, and now that I took it out after all these months, I might start playing with it a little bit more. Again, let me know if you'd like to see a longer video about this thing. And this next question is actually a conversation I eavesdropped on between Justin Frost and Jason Roos in regards to VR. Uh, Justin said after my review of the uh, Mirage Solo headset here from Lenovo that he felt like these things are still too expensive. But Jason said, hey, wait a minute, look where the prices have gone. We went from needing a very expensive PC and a equally expensive headset now to something that costs 400 bucks that integrates the entire experience, including room scale tracking. Uh, into a headset that requires no other device. And I think that is a very positive development. This is certainly not as good as an Oculus or a Vive hooked up to a big PC, but the experience, I think, for many consumers might be good enough if there was some software that was compelling enough to uh, make the investment. And I think that's kind of the chicken and egg problem we currently have with VR. But what impressed me about this device was that it did deliver a good VR experience in a self-contained unit, and the room scale tracking on this when you disabled the safety controls uh, was remarkable. I was able to walk my entire room here and uh, essentially walk in the virtual world that entire span of the room. I was walking from one end of the room to the other and I was able to walk through a VR scene with this headset uh, with that freedom of movement, which I thought was remarkable. That's something I can't do with my HTC Vive, uh, partly because I'm tethered to the computer, so there's a physical limitation, but I also, when you walk beyond the uh, sensors that you set up in the room, it can't track you anymore, of course, whereas this one can track you anywhere you walk, which I thought was pretty darn cool. And it's kind of similar to some of those commercial VR installations that they've got at Disney World now for that Star Wars thing that I am dying to try, where you can walk through an entire scene. Uh, you might be able to start getting a similar experience at home with one of these things, and I've really been impressed with where things are going. But ultimately, I think consumers just are not interested enough in this technology to get excited about it. They love their smartphones, but uh, the VR thing isn't just working yet for folks, and I think that's partly why uh, Google is pushing this Daydream setup with that uh, VR 180 system, and Lenovo uh, being one of the first to market with a Daydream standalone uh, headset here also released that camera we're going to be looking at. Uh, they put the two together as a bundle. It's no accident because I think they feel like maybe 3D 180 video might be a way to get consumers more interested in it. And I keep feeling like we're in this era that we were with the Google Glass when it came out. I did buy one. I was invited to buy one, which I uh, did. I don't know if that was such a good idea or not, but um, I was able to get my money back at least. And uh, you know, as I was playing with it, I felt ridiculous walking around with it. And maybe one day I'll tell you my story of the pickup experience with this thing. Uh, but I kept thinking how much great, how much better it would be to have the Google Glass experience in something like a watch that was more socially acceptable to people. And that's really where we ended up in that a lot of the features that we saw on the glass are now integrated into smartwatches from Apple and Google and others. And I think that might be what VR needs is something that looks a little less ridiculous on your head. This thing is enormous, by the way. Look at that. Um, so maybe something that doesn't look so crazy might be more fun. And I was hoping maybe that Magic Leap might be it uh, with the AR system that was supposedly going to project into your eyes or whatever. But uh, the field of view on that isn't quite there yet. So I think we need improvements in optics. We need our processors to get smaller and smaller so they don't take up as much room or consume as much power. And it might be another 10 or 15 years 
years before this technology really matures, which is something maybe we're not used to given how fast the smartphone uh, revolution took place. But I think a lot of the smartphone revolution was because of consumer adoption. So chicken and the egg all the way around. We'll see where it goes. But uh, VR is not going away just yet. And I think all these companies are trying to figure out what the secret sauce is to uh, hitting a uh, really deep market here. And they haven't yet found it. Now, my Q&A for you this week is what are your feelings about VR now that we do have a couple of standalone headsets on the market? We've got the Lenovo here. I'm getting in the Oculus sometime next week, so we'll check out the Oculus Go. Is that enough for those of you who have been on the fence to maybe try it, or is it just still not there? Is it software? Is it hardware? What are your thoughts about VR, and why are you not using it just yet? Let me know uh, in the comments below, and we'll have a discussion about that. Might be fun to have that discussion on the Facebook group as well. Now, our channel of the week this week is a podcast that I just started listening to. It is hosted by uh, Ben Thompson and James Allworth, and it's called Exponent. And it is a very wonky uh, podcast about tech and society. And they look at a lot of uh, emerging technologies and whether or not they are disrupting markets or uh, acting as a complement to them. And uh, it is really interesting stuff. In fact, they just had a uh, episode about Zillow, which is a popular real estate uh, website here in the United States that is now branching out into actually selling houses in addition to just listing them. And uh, they talk about some of the ways they had to uh, work around the realtors that may find them as a threat and how they might fit into the overall real estate market. Great stuff if you are into uh, the future of business, if you will, and disruptions and all the stuff we sometimes talk about here on the wrap up. Great stuff, definitely worth checking out. So this week, we've got a couple of things on the docket. That camera I keep talking about, we are collecting sample footage right now, so we have enough for you to check out on the Extras channel when we get the review up. I got in another Android TV box that supposedly runs Android TV. Uh, so we'll see if this one is just another hack or if it actually works uh, fully, including the casting capability. So be on the lookout for that. And we'll have a podcast that actually is already up on my podcast feed. I interviewed Douglas Black from notebookcheck.net and ultrabookreview.com. We talk about laptops, the past, present, and future of things that you can expect from them. So that's worth checking out. That's an audio ver uh, format right now, and the video will be up uh, sometime in the middle of the week. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or one-time contribution to the channel. Uh, you can also do that on Patreon if you wish, but the uh, donor box page is my preferred mechanism. We also have that ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a free Plex account to try it out, no credit card required, we get a small commission, and we'll do a little bit better on that commission if you sign up for a Plex Pass or gift it to somebody else. We do have a number of channels to check out. The Extras channel is at lon.tv slash extras, where I post supplementary content and unboxings. There'll be a lot of VR stuff for VR 180 stuff uh, coming up later this week. Uh, we've got the podcast, which I just talked about at lon.tv slash podcast. It's also available on most of the major podcatching applications out there. We have the Snippets channel where I pull out search-friendly portions of this and other videos. And we have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. If you like what I do, I do suggest that you click on the bell because you'll get notified every time I upload something, not just when the YouTube algorithm thinks you might want to see it. Uh, so I do that with a number of my favorite creators and hope you'll do that for me on all my channels. And we have some ways to engage with the channel. We've got the email list at lon.tv slash email. I may be sending out an email later this week because we are going to test the live streaming capabilities of that VR 180 camera. So uh, get your cardboard ready for that. Uh, we have the Facebook group at lon.tv slash Facebook group. I also have a Facebook page if that's not confusing enough, but a lot of my focus has been shifted to the group because more people are interacting in there than they did on the page. So we have about 325 people on the Facebook group right now. So you can sign up and start communicating with all of us. And uh, I will let you in. You do have to answer two very simple questions in order to get in, but most people haven't had a hard, haven't had a hard time doing that. So definitely check that out. And then we have the store where I resell things that I have purchased to review here on the channel and I'm now getting rid of. And if you want an email every time I change something in the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert. 
And in there, I have a Google Daydream headset that I reviewed a little while back if you want a good deal on one. So let me know. And all the prices there are suggested. So if you want to make me an offer on something, uh, please do just send me an email to lon at lon.tv and we can haggle a little bit and I'll tell you what I think of your offer. So until next time, we're going to uh, wrap this wrap up up and I will see you again later this week with that camera review first and then a whole bunch of other stuff as well. As always, thank you very much for your continued support and suggestions and comments and discussion and all the great things that uh, you have been doing to help this channel grow. And I look forward to providing more cool tech content later in the week. So until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.